So thank you very much to One to One Investment for having me here. I've heard a lot about the conference. It's my first time attending, and I can say for those of you that are watching online, you missed out not being here today. So it's also good to be attending a conference in person. I think we're all a little bit screened out, and I think it's particularly apt that we're here in Las Vegas because there are some parallels between gambling and investing in junior mining stocks. And in fact, I think they say, <laughs> there's a fan out there in the audience, uh, I think they say that uh, the way to depart a casino with a, with a small fortune is to make sure that you enter a casino with a large fortune. So why are we here today? I think it's so that we can do less of this and more of this. So how I look at the sector is really starting from the commodity cycle. I think the four most dangerous words in investing are, this time it's different. It is never different. And the fact that it's never different and the commodity cycle has a very predictable uh, trajectory, uh, if, if investors are aware of that and take notice of that and have some discipline as to where you are in the commodity cycle, it can really help increase your chances of success. And at the end of the day is why we're all so I think we're all familiar with the qualities of a bear market. Now, this chart that I'm going to walk through is really adapted from Lion's, Lion's Selection of Mining Corp. It's a great way to instill discipline to the investment decision-making process. I'm not copying. Imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. But I've adjusted in terms of how I look at the sector. So as we're aware in a bear market, what happens is all discretionary funding or expenditure, capex, it ceases to exist. And this is the R&D of our business. And in the long run, that's actually positive for underlying commodity price and then in future investment, that it's pretty hard to live with your own companies in a writing way down. Uh, we see asset write downs. Those of us that were exposed to the site, bear market, particularly in the gold sector from 2012 through to including 2015, it was a pretty horrific time. We saw asset write downs, we saw asset sales for majors, and in my experience, when majors start to sell assets, that's normally the sign that you're at the bottom. They're very good at selling assets at the bottom, and this is when juniors, if they have exposure to finan financing, should be acquiring assets. So prices begin to stabilize, uh, balance sheets start to improve, and speaking from experience, I had the, I suppose, the opportunity, I resigned from working for a precious metals fund, in the middle of 2015, and if we recall, 2015, the terror time market, everybody said, gold is dead, never coming back. We're leaving this, this sector. And normally when that happens, and sentiment is so terrible, it's a sign that you should start from living away at the markets. And so I had some flexibility and freedom to invest in the gold space. I was, I suppose, at peak gold knowledge because I'd just spent the previous five years with the Precious Metals Fund where we companies all over the world. And my thesis was, I didn't predict 2016, nobody did, despite many pundits having reverse appreciation of their, of their prowess, but I felt the sector was so bad, it couldn't get that much worse. And so my thesis was to invest in those stocks that had a strong balance sheet, could survive the next two to three years, and uh, a large resource base, but did not have to spend money. So essentially the optionality plays. I thought I was pretty clever when 2016 happened, but to be frank, you could have invested in absolutely anything at the end of 2015, and you would have had significant share price performance at the beginning of 2016. As a cycle starts to mature, uh, we see an increase in that higher risk capital rate. So expiration dollars start to be spent. We start to see smaller companies IPO. We start to see low-risk M&A, and we've seen a lot of this over the last three years. By low-risk M&A, I, I, that's where like meeting like, which producers either acquiring or combining with other producing companies. Uh, and then as the cycle begins to advance, and everybody starts saying you're in a bull market, even though you've probably been in an upwards trend market for at least two years, we start to see new discoveries. Obviously, if you're spending money on exploration, one would hope that you would see new discoveries. And then high risk capital starts to enter the sector. Key funds start to monetize assets, and we've already begun to see this in our sector. Orion has just recently started to exit from its Mantos Copper project by selling it to its uh, Copper Mines in Chile, by selling, selling it to Capstone. We had Appian announce their one billion sale of its two assets in Brazil to Sepanye. Uh, obviously, that transaction is unlikely to go forward. And of course, Waterton is starting to divest itself of its gold assets. 
As the cycle continues to mature, we start to see more aggressive M&A and higher risk capital becomes much more plentiful, particularly if you have some discoveries with those companies with ambiguous properties. You need to start getting concerned when investors demand growth. When the best investors demand growth, uh, companies, very rationally, the easiest way to do that, because to grow your business is very, takes a long time, it's got a capital investment, the easiest way to do that is to change your gold price assumption. So you increase your gold price assumption, your reserve decrease, your margins decline. That's all very well and good in the expanded gold price and uh, commodity price environment. But of course, what goes up must ultimately come down. So when you need to be very, very concerned is when moose pasture gets highly valued, generalists enter the market en masse, and you have a, a peak of capital raising. And you need to be fleeing the sector is when your taxi driver or Uber driver is talking to you about mining stocks. We see an explosion in high-risk M&A and prices begin to stabilise and then fall, and then we're back in the bear market. Thank you. So how do you increase your probability of success by making smarter decisions? So obviously, the cycle is absolutely paramount. You're in an upwards trend trending commodity price environment. A rising tide floats all boats. And conversely, a receding tide trend all boats. So for me, everybody would probably have a little bit of a different perspective, but for me, people are absolutely the most important. What you want to see is a fit for purpose management team. Well, that is the inherent skill set uh, of the people that they can advance their company and deliver on their strategy. You can have a very mediocre management team destroy value in a good project, and you can have a great management team extract enormous value in a mediocre project. And sometimes in our sector, one can be attracted to asset quality and think there's some rating opportunity. I'd call the, the value traps. If you do not have a management team in the board that is capable of extracting that value, uh, ultimately you end up not delivering on your investment. And of course, we want to see companies' uh, hard work. Being a CEO is essentially a 24 hour job. If you're seeing management teams at best conference, running around in shorts and shirt, nipping off the golf, I would say that's not a good sign. <laughs> On the project side of things, obviously project quality is paramount. The most important ingredient are the rocks. You can't change the rocks. Uh, the biggest risk in our business is grade, and with gold deposits in particular, you have big risk around grade because of the nature of the beast, that is their high nugget. So you can work on everything else with a project. You can work on the met, you can work on the mining, work on the social license, but you can't change the rocks. So quality of uh, the deposit requirement. Place, I think this is an interesting one. What we tend to see in our sector is a, angler, uh, is a bias towards anglophone countries. And by that I mean an investment bias towards companies with assets in Canada, in Australia, and in the States. I would argue that every single jurisdiction in the world has variable degrees of political risk. They just manifest themselves differently. So even though the States is considered to be a very safe jurisdiction for your investment dollars, we've just seen a company in Alaska have a reversal of its record of decision to build a road to its primary asset. Now this is occurred in Brazil or Peru or Chile, you'd be streaming nationalization. Strategy, of course, it's very, very important. Hope is not a strategy. So what you want to see is management teams that have a very clearly message strategy, uh, that strategy is realistic in the context of where you are in the cycle, and it's also realistic in the context of their balance. So if you're a tiny little tenant or a junior with a big, bust, multi-billion dollar capex bill, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to advance that on a standalone basis. Promotion, sometimes considered to be a dirty, dirty word in our sector, but it's really important. There are literally thousands of publicly listed junior exploration companies in the world all competing for a finite source of capital. And so management teams must have an ability to message their story in a way that's palatable to those sitting across the table. And Rick Poole said this best, essentially 60% of your job should be messaging the story and hopefully attracting that margin of dollar. I think one thing that we're remiss in our sector is we tend to be preaching to a captive audience of the same type of investment. I personally, if I was running a company again, I'd hire a millennial. I think there's enormous opportunity out there to increase our investor base. Obviously, the wider the number of investors that are interested in the sector, uh, theoretically, the higher your valuation will be. 
positive capital, this is a really important one, and I think even larger companies don't understand this concept. And what I mean by this is, what are you trading at relative to your share price? So if you're trading at a premium to your underlying value, the most efficient thing that you can do is issue equity. Now, everybody says that you're equity with the leader, but it isn't. If you're trading at a premium, it's very accretive. It is also accretive to acquire another company's shares. So those companies that are trading at a premium, they don't take advantage of that. Ultimately, they'll trade down to fair value. Other companies, obviously, if you're trading at a discount, that limits your options, and really what you need to do is try and get fair price up so it gives you a little bit more flexibility. Ironically, as an institutional investor, when you're sitting across the table from juniors, everybody is trying to twist themselves any way that they possibly can to show how undervalued they are. Theoretically, an investor could say, well, if you're that undervalued, you're doing something wrong in terms of getting the market to appreciate the underlying quality of your asset base. Of course, catalysts are in a strong commodity price environment. One would expect all companies to move upwards, but we would like to see catalysts above and beyond generally the underlying commodity price. And really the key one, the reason why we're all here and in this sector is the junior mining sector is one of those very few uh, sectors that are investable where you can have incredible share price performance in a very, very short space of time. I'm sure you're familiar with Thilo. They had an exceptional drill result last year. Stock rocketed up very, very quickly and continued with positive direction. Interestingly enough, for Union Gold, uh, I'm an investor. I started picking up my position here. They had a really good drill result. The market didn't take that much notice of it. So Union was one of those rare opportunities, if you're following the story, to start to accumulate a position before the general market got involved and started embracing the company. I think we're all familiar with a recent takeover, Kinross acquiring Great Bear. Absolutely fantastic for Great Bear shareholders. I think Great Bear is an example of a company that executed their strategy perfectly. In our sector, when the upside is unknown, by upside I mean proof theater, which is a resource estimate, we have a propensity to uh, assume infinite upside. And so Great Bear Management and Board executed purposely. This is less favourable if you're a Kinross shareholder, and I was a Kinross shareholder. And so what I thought was interesting as I put this chart together was the divergence of Great Bear for the announcement of the takeover from its peer group, which is the GDFJ. Now the company wasn't releasing news that was driving the share price. What was happening was exogenous events whereby Barrick was accumulating ground around Great Bears, contiguous with Great Bears property. Obviously, the market went, well, Barrick is going to take it over. And that takeover premium began to be expressed in the share price well before Kinross came in and took it out. So essentially, Kinross paid a premium on top of the premium. Resource upgrade, I've included this one because it's quite unusual for a share price to react very, very positively upon release of a major resource estimate. Again, back to the Great Bear example, when you have strong drill results, the market loves a story, they tend to imbue a very, very high degree of value, and that could be quite difficult for companies to meet those expectations. This is an example, Thales, with its exceptional discovery in Australia. The company had a very, very high multi-billion dollar valuation, valuation that we would all love to have, uh, and then they released their inaugural resource estimate, and again, uh, the, the share price responded very favourably. I'm involved with, as a, as a founding director with a company that's got a lookalike asset in Brazil, and we always point towards Chalice as the multi-billion dollar valuation we'd like to have as we go public. Quotology plays, I'm sure we're all familiar with these. This is a recent Newfound Gold example. Uh, Newfound Gold had a great discovery in Newfoundland. It's become the go-to place for exploration dollars. And what we saw was any company that had projects that were contiguous with Newfound Gold started to form in line with newfound gold. Now, Labrador, they delivered and produced some great brew results, and so they have kept their performance, but the company in blue has not. And so if you are trading based on closeology, that can be a dangerous game to play because ultimately the share price can decline quite materially if you don't deliver into market expectations. I just wanted to also highlight here that I've shown uh, three other companies in different land. All of these companies have resources, quite material resources, and ironically they are not getting the love of the explore codes despite the fact that they're arguably de-risked de -risk because they already have a full testament. 
Uh, people in promotion, sometimes simply the addition of a high profile individual to your board or management team can react in pretty strong chair plus performance. This is an example for, uh, from Oceana Gold, where two well known industry executives that have a strong reputation joined the company. I also thought what was interesting about Oceana Gold what it, is it's had outperformance more recently and it's had no news to drive that outperformance, but it's really correlated with their presence at the BMO conference in Miami late, late February, early March. Now, you've, I've seen this kind of behavior uh, post BMO previously. It's where uh, lots of global institutional investors, it's a company that gets exposed, the investing community reacts positively, and it starts to trade up uh, above its peers. Uh, this is an example of known investors. Particularly in a bull market, uh, you have known investors if they invest uh, that can dramatically impact share price performance. Uh, Michael Gentili is the new Eric Sprott. Whatever he invests in tends to result in positive share price performance. So Michael increased his investment in North Isle and obviously there was great uh, response as the market dived in after him. Arguably somewhat irrational because Nothing has fundamentally changed in the company other than getting an external tip of approval by a known investor. And now the company hasn't delivered that much news flow, but what is intriguing is that positive directory has been maintained over the longer term. You now in direct contrast, uh, I've shown another company that also has a large uh, copper gold project, but instead of being in British Columbia, it's in Chile. I joined the board of this company in January of this year and then was just recently made chairman. But what's interesting about it is Glencore invested with a 9.9% position, position in August of last year. Now, the market responded positively, but not to the degree of a known investor. And I would argue that Glencore understands the copper space very, very well. Now, interestingly, uh, Hot Chili has considered to produce positive news flow uh, over the recent months, but he's not seen that expressed in the share price. And one would argue that Chilean political risk is probably a negative overlay, but there's also been some recent positive news out of Chilean, Chilean terms of the fact that that, that nationalisation bill did not receive the supermajority that it needed to, to move forward. Political risk changes, this one's particularly relevant now. So in the blue is Polymetal, one of the la 10 largest gold mining companies in world, an exceptionally well-run company, but with a lot of exposure to Russia. So obviously with what's going on with Russia and sanctions and the invasion of the Ukraine, it had a precipitous decline in its share price down 90%. Now I gratuitously took the opportunity given the quality of the asset, there's obviously murmuring that the uh, Russian-Ukrainian situation will start to resolve itself. So I invested in this last week and just to show the incredible talk that you can see in our sector, the volatility can be negative and positive, it's up material in the last three to four days of trading. So really when you're exposed to our sector, you have to do the work. You can't just expect to make an investment based on a tip from a mate or a recommendation from a, from a friend, you actually have to do the work. And it's not just about maximising gains, it's about minimising losses. And I think this chart is really relevant because studies show that the most successful fund managers over the long term are those that sell their winners, their losers the earliest. And I think this is particularly relevant because of the polymetal case. So polymetal is down approximately 90% over recent weeks. It has to go up 900% just to get back to zero. So again, selling your losers early, one of the most accretive things that you can do. So the three that I look at when I invest is understand what you're buying. It's pretty simple, know what it is that you're buying. Monitor your investment. So is the thesis as to why you bought it still intact? Actually have to do some work here. And manage your investment. And by that I mean make a decision every time you look at it. Do you want to buy more? Do you want to sell? Do you want to hold? I turn this um, not entirely sure my acronym is going to take off, but I'm sticking with it. I'm nothing if not persistent. So this is the emotional cycle of investing and really what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that investing behaviour is very predictable in the same way that corporate behaviour is as a result of the commodity cycle. But what I want to show here is this is where juniors, everybody should be raising money. When investors are euphoric about the sector, they'll be willing to overpay. And conversely, this is where uh, if one has access to capital, that juniors should be acquiring assets. Now, if you can't acquire assets, there's nothing wrong with going into hibernation. And it's this part of the cycle that the smart money 
that PE funds tend to be acquiring assets. We're all here because we're interested in the equity of companies. It's really important to remember where you sit in the pecking order. As an equity investor, for the bottom of the bottom, it's critical to remember that most actions that companies take do not require a shareholder vote. So you could wake up one day and the management team has done something appalling and the share price reflects that and you just have to suck it up. So, uh, and then recently we've had an emergence of the royalty and screaming company a very large supplier of capital in our sector and their ownership trumps everything no matter what happens to the company or the asset royalty and streaming companies still maintain their exposure so at the end of the day you need to take a long-term view of our sector you need to be you need to look at stocks and go one of the hardest things that we can do is ride our winners sometimes the best thing that you can do is do nothing and a particular example that I can point to is a number of people that were invested in diamond fields pre the discovery, they said they only made the money they did because it had an unusually long lockup. So if they had been able to trade their stock, they would have sold well before and wouldn't have made the long-term gains that they did. So when I was asked to speak, I gave two possible topics. And one was the investing side of it and the other was lessons from the boardroom. So this got included, so I'm just going to touch on this briefly in my closing remarks. I could spend an hour and bore you to tears about my thoughts in the boardroom. And this really comes from 16 cumulative years as an independent director on companies from exploration through development, construction and operating. Sometimes I think there's a mismatch or a lack of understanding between directors and management as to what each other's roles are. And my advice to my former peers on the buy side is to get some board experience because how you think boards behave is not how they behave in reality. But fundamentally, all directors have a fiduciary duty and a duty of care to all stakeholders and shareholders. Now, I've differentiated these two because if you're listed in the States, your duty of care is to your shareholders. If you're listed in Canada, it's to all stakeholders. The main job of the board is to hire fire the CEO. Sometimes firing the CEO is a very good decision and to set the strategy and structure and ensure that management implements that strategy. Again, this is a point I've made throughout this presentation and I say it every time I talk about our industry, you need to have a fit for purpose management uh, board and management team. And so that is a board that adds value, that actually works, uh, and that you, if you're a manager, a uh, CEO of the company or an MD, you can draw on their expertise and experience. And I think it's particularly important to have a capital markets overlay on a board. Um, sometimes investment banking isn't your friend, the, uh, aren't your friends, because investment bankers, how they're driven is by fees. And so you need someone who understands how capital markets work, because if you misallocate your capital, that can have very, very uh, negative impacts to your ability to add value. We've seen this proliferation and focus on ESG and ESG box ticking, particularly in the last few years. And interestingly enough, the HP CEO came out last week and stated, uh, calling on all of his peers, that we need to start pushing it back against some of the ESG, the self-appointed ESG experts in the way that they're opining on our sector. So of course, once uh, outside auditors start inflicting their views on ESG, there's some box ticking that's involved. And this is an example uh, that a company that has had pretty terrible share price performance, so arguably hasn't been conducting its business well, yet it received recognition for gender diversity. And I would say that if you're looking at gender diversity at a, at a, at a company, you also need to include other aspects of the company. That is, is it doing its, its job and is it uh, delivering value to all stakeholders? At the moment, we have a very, very narrow view of diversity that's quite divisive. Diversity is more than just physical appearance. And in my opinion, uh, it must include diversity of appropriate experience and expertise. Thank you. Maybe elaborate on what that means to you specifically. I think that you want to have a, a culture that encourages open debate and discourse without people getting upset, taking offence and looking for a safe space. Uh, so, it, and it's about uh, your directors being engaged and understanding the sector and, and providing advice and guidance on how to best execute. So, ticking a diversity box when you're, and it's an incredibly important role, uh, directors, and sometimes maybe a symptom of the fact that our industry doesn't take it as seriously as they should is some of the box ticking that we see. Mining is a really, really complex business. 
It is not well understood or well appreciated by the general community. I'm sure that you've all dealt with people who aren't in mining that react quite negatively when they find out what you do. And so as a sector, uh, I think we've done ourselves a disservice also in terms of uh, engendering positive uh, positive reputation for the mining sector. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you can't, cannot choose not to be a successful product in mining. So again, it kind of circles back to having the right people in the right positions. And someone who might add value at an earlier stage of the company may add less value as the company grows and matures. And so it's a willingness to adjust your board and management team to come to the Thanks, Is your presentation available on a website? Because I think yeah, but I must have Absolutely. <laughs> 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 You uh, made the point between stakeholders and shareholders in Canada. What's just a couple examples of someone that's a stakeholder who's not a shareholder? Uh, your community, your employees. Uh, so there's been a, and why it's interesting in Canada, there was a legal case, and I can't remember the exact details, where institutions, where shareholders brought a class action lawsuit because they said that the actions that the company took were not in the best interest of the shareholders. Now, they lost that case because the company said it was in the best interest of the stakeholders. So that's the case. Stakeholders, but not shareholders, too? You think the bank is a stakeholder? A <laughs> shareholder is important to stakeholders. So. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, so, debt providers, and obviously, if it's a royalty or a stream, they're a stakeholder. Uh, investment bankers, if they're just clipping a fee, then they've moved on, I would say. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Oh. Yeah, what are some good <laughs> resources uh, that we can use to, to analyze mining stocks? Oh. Websites or, you know? Yeah, I mean, obviously, PICPO events such as this are already. Uh, increasing your knowledge base. Uh, there's, I think, some very, very good newsletter writers out there. Some of them provide things that are free, some of them you have to pay for. I think with what COVID showed us is, uh, is that virtual meetings can be very, very effective. And so what I've noticed is there's a huge amount of material online. So you can YouTube almost any company and find a presentation from the CEO. And for me, that's a really good stepping stone in terms of understanding how a CEO is messaging the story because it can be quite different to how their website presentation. Is. So, yeah, I think it's hard. It's hard trying to narrow down the information. Excellent. Well, look, I think we're there on time, Nikki. Thank you so much again. And